So yeah, so yeah, take the next three minutes to observe this painting. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, the title of this painting is uh, a young man introduced to the seven liberal arts by Sandro Botticelli. A young man being introduced does have that word in it. Yes, being introduced to the seven liberal arts. Okay, um, welcome those who have just joined us. So I wanted to ask, um, first and foremost, what did you notice? What did you notice in this painting? They're all female. They're all female, okay. Yeah. And all seated by, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they're all seated all the... Mm -hmm. I do think that this is a man. Yes. Okay, what else did you notice? Well, one of them's got a scorpion, I think. Yeah. And there's a, what looks like a, <clears throat> well, there's a tambourine on the ground and I'm not sure what the other thing is, some sort of frame, whether it's for weaving or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Has one got a bow and arrow in her hand? The one's the, the one on the right. The, the, the one that's sitting highest. Yeah, is that a 
a bow or something. That's, it, it looks like that to me. Yeah. I notice it seems like um, there's not one person in charge. Like they're all kind of um, just gathered together. It's not like it looks like a conference, but not like there's anyone particularly leading it. Oh, I like that uh, comparison. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's only a couple of them actually talking to each other. The two in the front foreground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It also looks like uh, one of them is holding the one who's supposed to be a man. Looks like they're holding hands, but kind of, I, I don't know how to describe that angle. It doesn't, it, I don't know. It's just, I noticed it, it's an, it seems like an odd way to um, hold someone's hand. Like maybe she's leading him in. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh-huh. I and actually that was noticed. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go I was ahead. gonna say I actually noticed the hand holding this time as well. And really um the gesture of like in her face, it really looks like an invitation, like mm -hmm. come with me, and I'm gonna come along with you and alongside of you as I lead you to my to meet my friends. Mm -hmm. Um so maybe he he does look a little like maybe he is. Uh, unsure or just checking everybody out by the way his eyes look um and so I feel like she's saying beckoning with a great invitation to make him feel welcome like come yes I noticed that as well like the direction of everyone else's eyes I get this I it, it causes me to feel like they're at home already mm -hmm. and the the young man is not at home He's the newcomer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, like like Martin earlier, I thought that there were old women. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> it, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Oh, now that you pointed out, that's okay. You are going uh, in and out hear. just a little bit. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. So, so, so that's that's uh, that, that's also a woman. But I also noticed that little um, child there. Mm -hmm. um, that he, the child is facing seven women. Well, there. Mm. You're breaking up again. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. So the what I heard you say is the child is facing. Um, you were saying something about the orientation or the way the child was facing. I didn't catch the part. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So the, it's facing, that the child is facing seven women as well, but it's not being led. Well, the hand, his hand is not being held as the man is. Mm, okay. Okay. Interesting. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't made that connection before on this painting. I like but that. It, but but at the same at the same time, he he see, well, the child seems to be included as well mm -hmm. in the introduction. Mm, there's an inclusion. Okay. Okay. All right. Anything else? What the there's sort of symbols all over the place. Like there's one, the green lady mm -hmm. on the right. She's got what looks like a, a right square, mm -hmm. you know, sort of a ge geometry type or building type thing. Mm -hmm. There's one with the, the cloth, what looks like a cloth or a scroll. Um, yeah, my guess is that these tell, tell us which of the arts they represent. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. I also noticed um, they don't seem to like, they seem in the women or the, yeah, the women seem interested in the person approaching, but not like, not everyone is even taking notice of them. Like it's kind of like, oh, okay, there's someone here. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. 
All right, well, I'm gonna pause there because this this is a very rich painting. We could spend a lot of time looking at it. Um, and I would invite you to look at this one more, especially after our discussion. And there's another painting that I'll send you afterwards that I think also has value to contemplate in light of this month's reading. Let me stop my share. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the reading. And the first thing I want to draw our attention to, and then I'm going to open it up for, I'm going to share a few things that I noticed. Um, and then I want to open it up to what you noticed in the reading, what questions you have and things you want to bring to the group to discuss. So um, that will be the format that we we use. So this month we're reading Philo. I hope that's how you pronounce it. I should have checked that. If that is the incorrect pronunciation, I, I acknowledge that. Uh, but he is at an interesting time in history. So one of the things I love about uh, Richard Gamble and his collection here is that he gives us a really good introduction for each of the authors and the context. In fact, um, I'll draw, um, if you have the work in front of you, um, I wanna draw your attention to what, how he really sets us up for success to read this work. Whenever we're reading any work, um, to, to know something about the author and the context in which this author wrote is important for us to be able to really understand what they're saying um, in order to understand the metaphors they're using, the allegory, and in, with this particular author, that's exceptional, especially important because he writes in allegory, he writes in metaphor. So in order for us to meet him where he is for us to have uh, un him unfold before us to hear what he has to say, we get to understand him a little bit more. So he uh, lived 20 BC to 50 AD. So during the time of Christ, um, he was born a Jew um, and he spent a lot of time bridging the Hellenistic and Jewish worlds together, um, which, well, I find fascinating. And so there was um, a group of people early on that attempted to do this. Uh, in the beginning, however, it was less, um, there was, it was kind of frowned upon. At first there was a, there was some, there was a, there was some in and out of this. The, at first there was a rejection of it. Like, no, we're not going to, um, we're not going to use pagan works in Christian world. And so it wasn't until later that people were like, actually, there's some value here. Let's look at the value. Um, and then you had right away the apostles who uh, were, were like, wait, this is the, the Messiah. Okay, so all we have is the Old Testament. So when you like read the New Testament, you are noticing they use the term scripture. Well, they would have been referring to the Old Testament. Uh, what we call the Old Testament, because they didn't have the New Testament. They were they were writing it. They were conceiving of how how is this Jesus, who he says he is, where does this show up in, you know, that was the work they were doing. So a little bit of context. The other thing, so notice in the first section, um, and for me, just a you may already have a process, but I'm going to share my process in case it serves you. Um, when I'm reading sections that give me information about the author. I use a series of symbols to help me categorize it so that I can refer back to it very easily. So whenever there's a mention about the author or the context in which he wrote, I write a little heart because that reminds me that's him. So the heart is, you know, who he is. So that triggers my mind very easily. Okay. When I'm going back to write my teaching notes, I go find all the hearts and I know here are my notes about who this author is and the context in which he wrote. The next symbol I use is a triangle and I use that to symbolize form. So anything that the commentator is saying about the kind of work this is, its form is going to help me know how I need to read it. So here, uh, Richard Gamble does a great job of giving us that information. He says a little bit about Philo and the context in which he um, was uh, writing. And then he tells us a couple important things. One, that he wanted to synthesize Hebrew scriptures with Platonic philosophy. That, uh, that, that's a really good thing to know. We, we know what he's up to. So we're going to, 
as we read, we can feel free then to make those illusions and connections. We can allow our imagination the freedom to, oh, that's a platonic idea without worrying if we're reading into it. That is the function of noticing those formal things ahead of time. It gives your imagination freedom to just go and make those associations. The next thing we find out is that he um, he uses he um, used allegory and extended metaphors. So again, if we didn't know that, we might be worried that we were reading too much into it or going too deep. But because we know that's part of his form, again, we have the freedom to go with it. We, there's a certain way you read allegory and we can do that. Okay, so, so notice that. And then he introduces the selections. Again, great information here. There's three um, sections of works that he has included. And, um, and then he gives us a, a comment about what they each are. So the first one, he tells us it's a meditation. So a meditation is like a personal journal entry. So he's personally reflecting on something. So we'll want to read that like a personal meditation since that's what it is. We um, One of the things that we're wanting to do um, in our own reading and especially in our teaching is to teach books according to their nature. So if it is a poem, well, we get to read it like a poem and discuss it like a poem. What is the nature of this thing and how should it be read and be held? Um, and when we do that according to its nature, it will unfold before us. We will perceive the truth, the goodness and beauty inside of it. So the first section is a meditation on the consolations of philosophy. Now, um, who here has read Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy? Has anyone read? Okay, so I don't know if you noticed, uh, but all, I thought about Boethius and the Consolation of Philosophy so many times throughout this work. And I'm like, wait, Boethius is not born yet. <laughs> he is way later, but you see a lot of echoes in there. Um, and I think that's okay to allow your mind to go there. It does make me wonder who Boethius read and how, um, if this author influenced him. Um, so the second work on mating with preliminary studies immediately just the title on mating with preliminary pre, 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 okay preliminary studies uh we we know this is allegory uh it, there is a metaphor being set up here so one we know it's allegory we're going to read it like that the other word he uses is treaty and so what is a treaty? A treaty is, you know, like a written work dealing formally, systematically with, with some topic. So not only is it allegory, but it's a treaty. So we get to keep both of those things in mind while we read that. Um, and then he tells us what this is an allegory of. So puts the cookies on the bottom shelf for us. This is an allegory on the liberal arts. And he tells us what the metaphor is going to be. He also lets us know what the big idea behind it is. So whenever I encounter a big idea for me, and you may find my symbols silly and that's fine, but I, I use a little bit of, I use a little cloud. And the reason I like that is because it, it doesn't assert anything yet. It's a big idea. It's something that I'm noticing. Um, and, and it's, it's still covered. It's still mysterious. I haven't, I don't know anything about it yet that, but it is something I'll get to discover. So I like the cloud imagery personally, and it's easy to draw. This is the other thing. I'm all about practicality and efficiency. So I want to use one pencil or one pen and, and continue reading. I personally do not like switching out highlighters and that sort of thing it takes too much time. So I, I use symbols for that reason. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, he says that the liberal arts is preparation or handmaiden for leading the soul to wisdom and virtue. So knowing that ahead of time, just like you have a thesis and a paper where you're going to keep checking back to the thesis, make sure you're on track. We're going to keep checking back with this idea to, um, to tell us, um, to help orient us to what we are, what we're learning. Um, there's a couple things at work when we do that. One, we're trusting the author that he knew what he was doing when he was writing. And we're also trusting, I am choosing to trust Richard Gamble 
that he is doing a good job of introducing me. Now, I may read some other commentary later on that um, that disagrees with him, and that's fine. But for this moment, for this reading, I'm trusting Richard Gamble, and I'm trusting this work, and I can assess it later. And then, of course, last but not least, the life of Moses um, fills in the biblical narrative of the book of Exodus by imagining what sort of education Moses received. This is a narrative. One of the things I love already about Philo is he's fun. He's playing with ideas. He he's and, and you'll see this in the first. I think we see this in the first paragraph of uh, where he's. Um, in his meditations on the constellations of philosophy, he is in love with imagining things. Um, and maybe I'm projecting, but he seems quite playful and where he, all the directions he's willing to go. Um, I appreciate that because I enjoy that personally as well. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. Any thoughts or questions um, at this point? Okay. All right. So the first section from the special laws, uh, book three, um, this is the, um, the brief meditation on the constellations of philosophy. Uh, so what did you get? Well, I, the first thing I'm going to say is I loved the opening paragraph so much. When I read that, the first thing I thought of was Plato's high view of philosophy. Um, and I mean, I'm just going to read it aloud. Um, is there anyone here that doesn't have the book yet? Because I want to just make sure how much context I should give in the discussion. Okay. Oh, well, that's good. All right. There was once a time when devoting my leisure to philosophy and to the contemplation of the world and the things in it, I reaped the fruit of excellent and desirable and blessed intellectual feelings. I'm like, oh man, you would have been my best friend. <laughs> Being always living among the divine oracles and doctrines on which I fed incessantly and insatiably to my great delight, never entertaining any low or groveling thoughts, nor ever wallowing in the pursuit of glory or wealth or the delights of the body. But I appeared to be raised on high and borne aloft by a certain inspiration of the soul and to dwell in the regions of the sun and to associate with the whole heaven and the whole universal world. This is Plato all over the place, this, this ascent of the soul to perceiving the highest things, the high view of the philosopher. I mean, he is painting this picture. Um, what, what did you guys notice from this section? What stood out to you? I really enjoyed the language with which he wrote this. Honestly, the first thing that came to my mind as I was reading his writing <clears throat> in these first few paragraphs was Anne of Green Gables and her perception and her flowy words and her understanding of seeing the world. And I thought the words were beautiful and there was so much delight in what he mm -hmm. um he found in contemplation and in the realm of just being able to uh, philosophize, <laughs> if you will, but just that pure enjoyment uh, for what it was and also to, then just to be able to express it in a way. I think just going back to recognizing that he's writing, like you said, it's like a journal writing. It's a, it's a meditation. The freedom with which he writes, um, which is completely different than his other writing, but the beauty with which he writes, he obviously, I wondered if he had read a lot of other things that um, called forth the beauty from within himself to uh, write with such, I guess, flowy oh. words or descriptive words. Absolutely. And we get that. We get that, too, from the introduction. Um, so one of the things and. Um, the, it says um, at the bottom of page 154, his extended metaphors startle the modern reader, but were commonplace in both literary studies prior to his time and in biblical interpretation for centuries afterward. And so there was a way of interpreting scripture that is pretty much foreign to how we interpret scripture and a lot of other things. 
um, that that had that freedom. Um, so if, if you study ancient and medieval biblical interpretation, it um, it 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 is very different. There's not all. It's not like the systematic theology of our day. Um, it has a very different. It, it's like this. It's like this. And and mm -hmm. good. So in this, one of the things we see is that it um, he. Gamble sets up for us and preparing us um, that he is discussing the conflict between the calling to wisdom or philosophy and the demands of public duties. Where, what do, what do you see? Where do you see this conflict? What does he, how does he set up this conflict? What did you notice about the conflict? Really, I would say one question. What is what is he saying that pulls him into this conflict? Envy he talks about. Yeah. <clears throat> Which I presume is the envy of others, maybe for uh, the position he's got, or to, maybe he works for someone. And, and, I don't know. It's not. He's tied up in politics somehow. Mm -hmm. but he seemed to be saying envy's... Uh, dragging him into all sorts of rather sordid disputes from what I'm reading of it. Mm -hmm. He's not enjoying it, but it's getting him down. Yeah. That made me really curious though. Why I was, it surprised me and I get it, but it, after that opening paragraph of how much he loved philosophy, I was almost surprised that envy affected him the way that it did. But is it his envy or the envy of others? Well, let's see. What does the text tell us? Does it tell us? I don't. He says, it says nevertheless, the most grievous of all evils mm. was lying in wait for me, namely envy. And it says it hates everything that is good and which suddenly attacking me does not cease and drag me after it by force um, into the vast sea of cares of public politics in which I still am, blah, blah. And so it's, mm. I, I just, Got the you get the impression that it was sort of forces in the in public politics that were mm -hmm. driven by envy rather than his own envy, but mm -hmm. maybe I'm misreading it there. No, that's a good point. I didn't think about it that way when I read it. And and I mean, we only have a small amount of text here, um, mm. so we can. There's some that we're going to have to infer. Um, my mm. mind went to because he's a philosopher, and and I tend towards that as well. So I usually want to get involved in discussing ideas and a lot and and i want people to know my temptation is i want people to know that i'm smart <laughs> and, yeah. and i have to check myself all the time no i get to be authentic and faithful <laughs> um and and so i'm like i feel like that is a common temptation for people who love philosophy we love to hear ourselves talk and <laughs> that sort of thing i mean I'm just being honest. I don't know any philosopher that doesn't struggle with that at some level. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that, I don't know. Can it be also that he is, when he is called back to public service and he has to be um, doing the kinds of demands that, you know, being a public servant does, that he, uh, kind of disassociates from seeing the big picture of what it is that he's really trying to do. So, mm -hmm. so it's like being, uh, being bogged down by the details and by the people around him, as opposed to thinking beyond that and, and the reason why he's in public service in the first place, uh, meaning serving, serving the, the common good. Um, in, in which he was put in as a yeah. public servant. Maybe it's just the simple reality that you've got to earn a living somehow. And uh, he had to go and work. And, and numbers he would have loved to have just stayed reading his books and contemplating and stuff, but it doesn't put food on the table. Maybe that's, that's, just, that's where the envy comes. He, he wants to have that... <clears throat> You know, freedom to be able to do that, but he just he can't, so he had to get involved in public affairs, which then created all these other issues for him. Maybe mm -hmm. it's something like that. 
Oh, yes. Okay. I see the direction. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I noticed um, towards on the top of page 156 that his love of philosophy and um, learning and understanding is what's it's still serving him, though he can't um, devote all his time and energy to it and feels um, flooded and overwhelmed by the demands of, of his life. Um, he's not, he's kept from utter despair, this is what you mean. Uh, but I open, my, I open the eyes of my soul, which from an utter despair of any good hope had been believed to have been before now wholly darkened and I'm irritated with the light of wisdom, since I am not given up for the whole of my life to darkness. Right. Mm, yeah, I noticed that as well, which leads me to ask the question, what is, I mean, because we already know that this author in particular uses metaphor and allegory. So what's the imagery he sets up for us? What What's the imagery he uses to describe this battle? What kind of imagery? Or this tension. He talks about pitiless masters mm -hmm. on page uh, 156. And it's not just people, it's also the affairs that he's involved in through this public work he's got to do. And they seem to be keeping him away from his studies. That seems to be. So he finds delight in the studies and he really wants to be there, but he, he, he can't. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so with that's what the envy is. He'd really like to be, you know, one of, someone so wealthy he can just spend all his time contemplating. I'm not quite sure there, but that, that's the only thing I can think of is what the envy is. It's uh, Maybe he's not from as wealthy a family as some other people are. Interesting. Uh, I'm seeing so, what you're saying yeah. now about it being directed at him, not coming from within him. When I first read it, I assumed it was within him but now as i'm hearing you talk about it more i'm like oh i see that yes it's yes okay mm. um i noticed the metaphor is of, of a flood the torrent like being um yeah overwhelmed by a flood yeah mm -hmm. lots of water imagery waves yeah, being swept away Mm hmm. And that goes right along with what you were saying, Martin, about, you know, that it's pulling you back, like the way that a tide feels when it like you're trying to get out or get in and it pulls you in the opposite direction. And you have to fight with it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm the thing that I'm reflecting on is, you know, remembering back at university, mm -hmm. you know, where you can you've got all that time to sort of study and enjoy learning things that you want to learn and. Uh, but the reality is you can't stay there <laughs> you've got to go out and get a job and have, and life comes along that that i just he, he seems to be battling with something like that that's why i'm reading this a lot yeah and and, and he but he doesn't want to get drowned by life he wants to um by the you know the busyness of life i'm talking about the the pitiless masters but so he wants to continue to go back to his philosophy and um, not like he says, so that I'm not wholly sunk and swallowed up in the depths. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that's the way I'm reading it, anyway. But I did. I sort of thought back to the university days. Sometimes you th you think it would be lovely to just stay there for all the rest of your life, but uh, yeah, you, you can't. Yeah, that's why I became a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that I saw when you go back to the introduction it says that he comes from a politically connected family. And then it also says he, um, he leads a, an envoy to Rome to plead that they not be penalized for refusing to worship the emperor. And so I wonder also about the envy of, um, or even the pressure he may have felt coming from a politically involved family himself and knowing that his other family members had been involved or even just a personal conviction. I mean, the fact that he led, I mean, that's what it's saying, right? He 
he once represented his Jewish community as an envoy to Rome to plead. I mean, clearly he's struggling in between um, staying in this realm of his head and also staying within the realm within the moment that he's been placed in as a Jewish person, they're facing these immense pressures mm. um, to worship this emperor. And so it's like that tension that, yeah, anyway, I just wonder about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And notice how the background information informed those connections. Why do you think this is in here? The subtitle of the book is Classic Readings on What It Means to Be an Educated Human Being. I think Gamble's comments correct. It's it's a uh, meditation on the familiar conflict between the calling to wisdom and the demands of public duties. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so that's that's a reality that every person who might be doing education has got to face. You, um, it's, it, public duties also press against you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I can see some Platonist of Platonism in this the, the paragraph in 156. And what, what I was actually thinking about is when Plato talked about um, the three souls or the three parts of the souls mm -hmm. where, you know, you have the head um, and the chest and the appetite. So to go back to what he was talking about envy, I think about that as the soul of the appetite. But because Philo is pretty much a lover of wisdom. He can rein in and control that passion in him and go beyond and transcend what, you know, what, what the envy or the uh, unvirtuous passions that he might be feeling. And he can go beyond and think beyond that. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had thought about that. Because so we're looking at a cultivated man. <laughs> yeah, because he said, because he said here, um, let's see. Uh, but even in these circumstances, I ought to give thanks to God. And though I am so overwhelmed by this flood, I am not wholly sunk and swallowed up in the depths. Mm -hmm. But I open my eye, but I open the eyes of my soul, which from an utter despair of any good hope and had been believed to have been before, now wholly darkened, and I am irradiated with the light of wisdom, with, uh, since I am not given up for the whole of my life to darkness. Mm -hmm. So for me, I read that as what he knows, what he's gained through loving wisdom and studying philosophy is that he is able to think beyond what and think beyond and um, control whatever uh, passion you know envy he sometimes feel mm -hmm. um, being a public servant during this time yeah do you think it's possible to escape this this ocean dynamic this this tension between the public life and like do you think he was specifically forced into this or do you think this is a comment on what what martin was saying we all struggle with like leaving university and this is always a tension we will feel i i was just going to comment along those lines um as well, like it seems to be so it's so relatable, and it feels like a comment on the both the possibilities and um, and graces that come along with um, pursuing wisdom, but then also the limitations that it's not it's 
it will it can't it's not going to allow you to bypass life. You still have to walk through life and um that it will be hard. You know, and so and coming, I think, from a faith perspective, it's like, oh yes, um, education is a um is a gift, it's a, it's a way of like you like you just mentioned, it's cultivate like a fully cultivated person, um, but it it can't be a savior. Mm. 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 Well, I, I I do I do think myself this is the issue really because I also think it comes out of the Platonism which is a if I recall rightly it's a focus on the ideals and a philosopher the ideal from a philosopher's viewpoint with that view would be to sit in your ivory tower and contemplate that would actually be completely disengaged from the, the real world seems to me or looking at it but not being actually involved in it whereas um, speaking as a Christian now, I'd say God's created us to serve others and wisdom has to be preparation for service. So in a sense, what I think the tension that's being created here is something due to the um, pagan philosophical uh, disconnection between the real world and the, the wisdom, whereas the scripture always talks to me as it wisdom is very, very practical as well that needs to be lived out so I, I, I just wonder whether that's actually what the issue is here is just a disconnect between you, you know the, the two different uh, worldviews sort of clashing a little bit he's, he's coming at more of a platonist than he is as a uh, I don't think he's a Christian he's a Jew uh, I think if I'm understanding that correctly that's what I'm wondering what's going on here is and he wants to have that pure devotion to that pure ideal world and wallow in that but, but of course you just can't do that <laughs> in this in this real world yeah. mm. so i'm just speaking too much but that's what i think is no, happening you're great thank you um i i yes i can see that and as you were speaking it reminded me of what the monastic tradition did for classical education which in a lot of ways redeemed work um one of the um the claims or um, what's the word I'm looking for? One of the ways that people, one of the issues that people have with classical education is they'll say that it's elitist and they'll point back to ancient Greece and Rome um, and there's other things they point to, but one of the things that will sometimes come up is, oh, it was built on slavery. Like you can't have the leisure that the Greeks had to contemplate the way that they did without slave labor or this slave working class or this lower working class. Um, what monasticism did was bring together work and contemplation and, and made it embodied in a very bodily way. Um, the trouble with monasticism is it was an escape from the world you, you know they they fled inside the walls of their monastery and so while it, they they did have to work in there they, they were they isolated themselves from the world around them quite a lot so i, I think it's more platonic personally okay. with, um, the monastic movement than not um, it's just a counter opinion on that one <laughs> yeah i yeah i i've heard definitely different arguments on that one some will say actually just finished I'm reading a book for Lent about the monastic tradition actually and the author of the book is talking about that very thing which is outside of the context of this book so I'll not go on a rabbit trail there but <laughs> but I am very interested in having that conversation as well <laughs> but um the, so uh okay Oh, I remember the question. So do, what what do you, did, did anything come up for you in the reading um, as it relates to uh, how, like, is there, was there any inspiration for 
what this means for how we teach, for how we learn. I'm assuming most of us are teachers here. <laughs> yeah. I do think that, you know, he, he talks about the desire of instruction, which has been implanted in his soul from his earliest youth. He talks about that. In other words, when you talk about education, that's where you're working with the young person, hopefully forming their loves. Mm. And if it, what he seems to be describing is he, he was successfully formed a love of learning at a very early age. Yeah. And that's what's carried him through. So from an educational viewpoint, it seems to me, we must therefore uh, strive to really engage young people so that they have a desire of instruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I work in a school here and uh, the big battle often with young people is that they're so disengaged with wanting to learn. They just, it's sort of a chore. And unfortunately, um, a lot of modern approaches to learning just make that even worse, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. So th that would be the goal. <laughs> if we can actually work to this delight that he's talking about, because it's kind of carried him through right, right through his life. That's what he seems to be saying. He wants to go back to that. He remembers that it's something he's passionate about. And though he's distracted, he's not going to get swamped by the world because of this great love he has. Yeah. Yeah. And that actually makes me think of the painting that we looked at the little boy in the painting. When I, when I contemplate that painting, I often, my mind goes there. What you just said, Martin, my mind goes there. When I look at that painting, that that little boy is the child version of the grown young man uh, and reflects that idea that you just said, um, that it must have begun, had to have begun earlier, which would then point to, I think, Ave, Avelina, is that, am I pronouncing, um, what you were saying about the direction the child was looking. And this is the perfect segue into the second section. <laughs> um, on the mating with the preliminary studies. I have so many notes here on this one. Um, I have to be honest, <clears throat> this, I had so many, I had personal resistance. Uh, yeah, well, and, I, and I'm glad that I did because sometimes when we read something, I'm sure we all have ex experienced this and our students have most certainly experienced this where uh, they're not really interested um, or there's um, a resistance, like they, they have a reaction to the piece. And I had to um, really lean into my curiosity, my philosopher mode <laughs> to, um, to surrender to this piece and, uh, and, and learn from it. Because some of the metaphor parts of the metaphor he was using, I connected it with modern notions that would have made it offensive. But in his time, these were not offensive metaphors to make. And so I, I'm presencing that up front. I don't know if anyone else had that experience. I did a little bit. And so I just had to keep presencing myself to the time that he was born. He lived in a time um, and, st and, and the story of Abraham and Sarah is from a time where it was very common to have a concubine or a handmaiden and they served a purpose. There was, there was, it was part of the society and the structure uh, of the family and the community. And, and it doesn't carry the weight that our, it would carry if that were to happen today in our society. And, um, and, and at the same time, I was really, there was ways that it was talked about where I'm like, well, that's kind of like a redeeming view of that story as well. So I'm presencing that. So if any of that comes through in my discussion, I apologize ahead of time. I, I did my best to <laughs> put my assumptions aside and see the text for what it is. So, um, but I just, I also wanted to point that out is because when that happens, 
and it's going to happen. What do we do with that? When we ground ourselves back in what we know to be true. So the first thing I grounded myself back in was the author, where he was born, the time he was from, and then the question before us, which was, this is an allegory on the liberal arts. And, and so I went back to this thesis. This is not a comment on anything else. It, that's what the allegory is for. So I can ground myself back in what is actually being talked about in order to, to continue following the metaphor. The other thing that it does, when we ask our students to do this, we're asking our students to suspend judgment to um, to seek to understand before I I get to, I have to earn my right to give an opinion. My first task is to 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 withhold my opinion, to withhold my judgment until I understand. And until I do that, I have not earned the right to give my opinion. And so that's what I teach my students. And so that practice is hard sometimes, especially if it brings up something. Um, and, and so when we practice that, that, that is also virtue, you know, our students are practicing virtue every time they do that. So side, side note for that, but okay. Um, what, what stood out to you? So we, um, well, first I want to, to point out the, the pattern, um, which he does this in the next one a little bit as well, is starts with the story and then unpacks it. So we kind of, we get a grounding in the story and then he unpacks it, but he does so in a, he weaves it. He's weaving as he unpacks. So he adds other elements of the story or focuses in on an element of the story while also revealing the, the allegory. The, I will point out a couple of things. Okay, so um, so in the first section on page 156, the first thing I wanted to point out is when he says, and the wisdom which is in me and the temperance which is in me and the particular justice and each of the other virtues which belong to be alone, to me, I think that was supposed to be me. That sounds like um, to me alone are the princedom of me alone for such virtue being a queen from its birth rules over and governs me who have determined on obeying it. Um, so he's talking this, this phrase, particular justice is, is referencing the idea that justice is when all the aspects of the soul are, have virtue. And so to the extent, so the platonic idea there is that to the extent to which all the aspects of the soul, those three parts, have virtue is the extent to which a person is just. So justice is the virtuous immaterial being. So the, the in, intellect, the, um, the appetites and the affections all have virtue in it. And so the classical world has an answer for that. And so does the Christian world. So you can look at the early church fathers and their cures for the vices in those areas. They also have um, the vices and the virtues, um, and then ways for developing the virtues. Um, you have a classical answer to that, and you also have a Christian answer to that. But when you when you see, especially in older writings, things that mention like particular justice or um, speak about virtue or justice in that way, that is what it's referencing. The other thing that I wanted to point out was um, that he seems to be, uh, one of the things I noticed in this first and second paragraph is um, that he seems to be talking about uh, pointing out that like things produce like things. Um, so um, he, now this virtue reports as being both barren and almost prolific since he affirms that the most populous of all nations is sprung from it. For in real truth, virtue is barren with respect to all things which are evil. So virtue is barren with respect to all things which are evil. So virtue does not produce evil because it's not the kind of thing. Virtue and evil are different. And so, you know, uh, and then he goes on to explain um, talking about animals and fruit 
that lion, he doesn't say lions, but lions produce lions. The idea here is lions produce the lions, bears produce bears, humans produce humans. Virtue does not produce evil. Um, what I, and then the next line, he says, but so for in real truth, virtue is barren with all respects to evil, but is so exceedingly prolific of good things that it stands in no need of the art of, of, of the midwife, for it anticipates it by bringing, for, bringing forth before its arrival. That is amazing to me. Um, in my high school class right now, we are studying Boethius' Constellation of Philosophy, which is probably why I keep bringing it up because that's fresh on my mind right now. Um, and, and one of the things we were discussing today is how you know it's a, the thing if it has a thing. So if I am healing people, then I'm a healer. If I'm orating, I'm an orator. And, and that if there is vert, the fact that it's present there means it's already there like it does it just is it is already that and I thought that was fascinating um it just and then it keeps producing like it doesn't tire of that almost like the healed version of passion like you know how when you have a passion or desire for something if it's a a um a um an addiction you just keep producing the vice or the, the, whatever it produces and not necessarily good things. And you kind of can't stop because it's an addiction, but this seems to be like the, the, the redeemed version of a passion, still the same faculty or the same mechanics in our being. I'm searching for the word, but, but virtue. I think um, it, it makes me um, remember something that I've heard that if you, well, okay, um, talking about habit, forming a habit of something virtuous, that it becomes you, just, just to piggyback on what you're saying, Jennifer, mm -hmm. forming a habit that becomes a virtue, and it just, it, it and, and it, even if you well, if you're virtuous, you don't stop doing that kind that kind of deed that made you virtuous. But you are just known to be courageous, right? When you develop a habit of being courageous, and and it's become you, it's become your virtue. Even if they're you just become known as somebody who is who is who is mm. courageous or you just become courageous you just be you just you are just courageous mm -hmm. i think that's that's how i'm trying to remember what i've heard before to what you just said mm, um, so it stops being something you're trying to do and it is how you be it is yeah. your yeah, because it's 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 become your it's it's become a habit to you. It's become it's 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 you now. It is you're not really working hard to be become that you know become that person. It's, mm. it's you. I don't know. Internalize it. You just be. You just be. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really the purpose of education, isn't it? To shape a young person so that they become habitually virtuous. Yeah. That's in, in all things, you know, intellectually virtuous, uh, physically virtuous, and uh, in speech. And I'm sure that's what he means by says at the end of this section, it says it produces virtuous reasonings, which is your thinking, irreproachable counsels, which is your speaking and praiseworthy actions, which is your doing. Mm. Seems to me that's, and I think uh, what Lena was saying is dead right. I mean, it, it, the ideal is it becomes a part of you. you in other words, your character is shaped to the point where these just flow out of you. 
but the, I mean, I'm a Calvinist, so I mean, I know people are born totally depraved. So this has to be a, a fruit of education when person's young. As, you know, you think of a young baby; they are not inherently virtuous in the way they act. They're just very selfish. And as they get older, parents shape them and through you know parental correction, discipline, and so on. Uh, so that a lot of these things become habitual, but then the gospel comes along and the transforming power of the spirit continues that work, seems to me. But I think that's what we're talking about, really. Yeah. And 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 that's opens up the image that he's giving us. So the allegory, Sarah representing virtue, this this high ideal, and that he, Abraham can't actually, and this is what was so surprising to me. And if I hadn't allowed myself to like push my offense aside, I would never have, you know, recognized this. Um, but that Abraham wasn't worthy of Sarah yet because he couldn't receive her. He couldn't actually, he wasn't ready for virtue. He, he didn't have virtue yet. And so he had to be led to her by the handmaiden, which reminds me also of the painting. The, the, the young man is being led into the circle of the liberal arts and the lady that's sitting at the top is prudence or wisdom. What did you guys think of the allegory? What stood out to you? Because we could go a lot of different places with it. So I want to make sure that we're also talking about the things that are landing for you as well. Well, just one thing that I'm not clear on, you know, uh, see that, that it stands in no need of the art of the midwife. Um, for it anticipates it by bringing forth before it's arrived. He's, talk, he's talking about in virtue as barren, mm -hmm with evil, but good things, that it stands in no need of the art of a midwife, yet that seems to me to be saying it's just going to come naturally. And I don't believe, people, I mean, I thought that was part of the role of a teacher is essentially like a midwife, um, to draw, draw things out, to, um, yeah, that, that, that's just, a, a, I'm just puzzled here whether he's assuming there's this natural virtue in people that's just there. And in other words, it's, it's Platonism again. <laughs> and his assumption of the, the goodness of the human heart, which, I, as I said, I'm a Calvinist, so I reject that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's the only question. I'm just, I'm just not sure wh why he says that, that it stands in no need of the art of a midwife. Does anything come to mind for... The rest of you to this question? That's a good question. A couple things come to my mind. Just this is just thinking about this for the first time, which I want to think about it more. And uh, yeah, so what comes to mind first is so if if a woman has a baby, I am already a woman. I'm already a human and I give birth to another human. I still need a midwife. Um, I wonder if he's referencing almost like a foreshadowing of when it's already virtue, virtue just produces more virtue and doesn't need the midwife to help bring it out once it's already virtue. Oh, okay. Yeah. That I, I don't, yeah, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. And yeah. also, I think of the Socratic um, teaching triangle, where it's you have the ironic phase um, that goes from the the misconception or the falsehood that the the person believes, and then through the deconstructing of uh, through questioning, deconstructing that falsehood, and arriving at the metanoia moment, the the turning around. And then the building back up, which is, can be associated with midwifery. I must, um, the teacher must through questions, lead them to the truth. So they're not just left in their metanoia moment, but coached back in alignment, you know, 
back into the community, you know, um, okay, so here now perceive the truth. So there's like, there's a falsehood and they're ignorant and they are not aware that they are ignorant. They become aware that they are ignorant, but now they must now, we want them to know the truth. Um, and generally that's described as a midwifery from the realizing they're ignorant to perceiving the truth. Virtue wouldn't need that because it already is aware it's of itself. You, it, it's where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I get that. I suppose I'm, I'm thinking that it's actually forming virtue in a, in a person. Mm -hmm. It's because, I mean, scripture says, you know, there's no unrighteous. Virtue is not natural to us. Uh, our nature is the opposite. So the question is, how does virtue get formed in a young? I mean, that's what education is really about, isn't it? It's forming yeah. virtue in a young person. And I think depending on the tr Christian tradition you're in, there may be differences. Yeah. How right. that question is approached. Yeah. I'm, I'm Greek Orthodox. So, so we have a different view of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think definitely your tradition may change how that's <laughs> yeah. talked about. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, uh, yeah. Well, we Calvinists come from a pretty, dark view of human nature yes um, this yeah. is true yeah. Yeah. Edgar Allan Poe's of <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but that gives I mean that that's why God's glory is so great because he takes the likes of us and transforms us over well, his word and spirit yeah. and, and actually does generally produce virtue in us so mm. yeah. well and I think I and I don't know the answer to the question that you have raised. I think that um, what the questions I want to ask about it is, are, um, how is he viewing virtue? And this is probably what I should have said first. How is he viewing virtue in this statement? Is he seeing, how is he seeing virtue? Is he viewing virtue as um, like this arrival state of it? Like, because that would answer the question. That would answer your question. If we can figure out, how he's viewing virtue there, then we're going to have a, a better likelihood of answering that question. Mm -hmm. well, and so maybe, maybe that's a good question to like write down and contemplate that might be one that takes more inquiry and questioning than, um, does anyone else have thoughts on that? Because there's, there's two parts to this. And this is where the practice of like suspending, like noticing um, and we're, you know, as adults, this is sometimes easier noticing our opinion about a thing and then trying to uncover what the author meant. So the first step is what did the author mean by it? And then after we understand what the author meant by it, then we can be like, I agree with that. I disagree with that. Okay. Anything else? Okay. I wonder whether he's talking about the ideal state though of virtue. It was if there is true virtue then it will always produce virtuous reasonings irreproachable counsels and praiseworthy actions that's but he's not necessarily making a comment about whether you actually have virtue naturally is no is it maybe that's what he's going to deal with next is how how you build virtue into a person he's, but he is saying if virtue is present this is what it will do and it doesn't need a midwife to do it i would maybe. agree with that if if yeah. virtue is present yeah then this is what it does this is what virtue yeah. looks like yeah mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's sort of a, it's unstoppable and i think what lena was saying about it being natural just flows out of you is, mm -hmm. is exactly what's been described right and 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 eventually if you have been helped and guided by a midwife a teacher a, a teacher eventually you will get to a point where you have acquired that virtue mm -hmm. that you wouldn't be needing a teacher anymore that's right you do it yeah. Yourself. yeah right it, yeah when it's fully formed yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and then that goes into the the seven liberal arts so you um uh, i'm going to jump over to 158 where he's talking about the liberal arts um that i that it in, in studying, well, hold on, actually. Okay, so 157, bottom of 157, he says, 
And the greatest of all, oh, let me back up. So the encyclical branches of instruction are placed in front of virtue for they are the road which conducts to her. Um, actually, I'm gonna go back up to the beginning of the section because this picture, it is, well, I think it's beautiful, but um, on this account, he does not say that Sarah did not bring forth at all, but only that she did not bring forth for him, for Abraham. For we are not as yet capable of becoming fathers of the offspring of virtue, unless we first have all have a connection with her handmaiden. And the handmaiden of wisdom is the encyclical knowledge of music and logic arrived at by previous instruction. So this is our precursor. Um, and move down a little bit. The encyclical branches of instruction are placed in front of virtue for they are the road which conducts to her. And as you must know, that is common for there to be great preludes to great propositions. And the greatest of all propositions is virtue, for it is conversant about the most important of all materials, namely about the universal life of man. Very naturally, therefore, it will not employ any short preface, but rather it will use as such grammar, geometry, astronomy, rhetoric, music, and all the other sorts of contemplation which proceed in accordance with reason, of which Hagar, the handmaid of Sarah, is an emblem, as we will pr proceed to show. What a beautiful image. Like, just imagine that as a painting or a movie, and all of these things were personified. Like, this entourage this long prelude leading up to this crescendo, this moment of revelation oh, virtue. after this, this working and this being, practicing being, I guess sometimes practicing being feels like work when it's new ways of being. Um, what a beautiful image and how, what a redeeming view for Sarah <laughs> that, uh, which is different than how I was taught about that story when I was younger. Well, what a redeeming view of Hagar too. Yes. I think. Um, you know, because now she is imaged here as someone who is leading Abraham to uh, virtue. Yes. Not yeah, the very uh, concubine or not just a mistress, mm -hmm. but actually someone who is more important than that. Um, someone who's act, who actually contributed to, you know, with, with the hand of God working mm -hmm. on them, contributed, contributed to Abraham's finally getting to what God promised him to be, the, mm -hmm. um, was it his covenant with him that through his through him, what was it? <laughs> um, the, 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 the sands, <laughs> yeah, the stars and the, yes, the, the nations yeah. so of Israel will come forth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, even in the very last line of this section he says whoever therefore has acquired wisdom from his teachers would never reject hagar for the acquisition of all the preliminary branches of education is wholly necessary What's standing out to the rest of you with this, this elongated mode of metaphor? We have the metaphor itself, and then we have the particulars where he addresses the different liberal arts. Um, and then we have the section at the end where he's talking about the external world and the realms we can judge. I felt like he was saying in this last section that, that these liberal arts is what causes us to be able to judge the external world, which then would make it distinct from 
the spiritual world. So the role of the liberal arts can cultivate what, it, what, what are the limits and possibilities of the liberal arts and what does it cultivate? What the liberal arts, if, if the liberal arts are Hagar, they're not Sarah, which would be virtue and prudence. Okay, well, let's turn to page 158. So on 158, um, in section four, this is where he discusses the particular liberal arts. Um, so grammar, so let's walk through those for a minute. Um, so I think, does every, how is the general metaphor landing for everybody? Okay, so we're good with that. Okay, so now let's walk through the liberal arts. So grammar, by teaching you the histories which are to be found in the works of poets and historians, which will give you intelligence and abundant learning, and moreover will teach you to look with contempt on all the vain fables which erroneous opinions invent, and on account of the ill success which history tells us that the heroes and demigods who are celebrated among those writers meet with. All right, grammar. Literature and history, literature and history, which if you haven't, one of my favorite, like uh, super accessible resources for navigating the liberal arts in, an, in, in a more traditional way, the way that he's talking about them in here is the liberal arts tradition by Clark and Jan. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a chart at the back of it that discusses um, this very simple chart that discuss that lists each liberal art, the skill, because the liberal arts are arts of truth perception. Um, the content that was used to coach that skill, the traditional form that was um, considered in coaching, so where they got their instruction, and then the nearest contemporary form. Well, what it says about grammar under the skill is the art of grasping concepts, being at home in language and learning from the authors, uh, most normally what is said of poets and of prose writers. And so with each liberal art, one of the reasons it creates virtue is that in order to practice that skill, you have to practice virtue to practice that skill. You're practicing virtue every single time that you practice these liberal arts. In order to learn to read, I mean, just think about some of the things I shared and what each of in, in, in this experience. We each had to, I, I'll speak for myself, I had to come outside myself and the um the acts I wanted to grind with some of the things that hit me and be like, no, I'm going to put aside my assumptions. I'm going to put aside my opinions. I'm going to put aside all of this and I'm going to do my best to be open to what the author has to say and seek to understand what the author has to say. I learned to be at home and I'm still not real. I mean, I'm still learning, you know, I feel like I could spend a lot of time with this author, but I'm beginning to learn to be at home with him in his writing. It doesn't feel like home right now, though, because it's very foreign to me. This was, you know, it's from a different culture and he has a lot of perspectives and mindsets that are not, that do not feel at home for me. It's very different than my culture. So there's more work for me to do to feel at home here. But that's what grammar is all about. Um, that's what grammar is all about. It will give you intelligence and abundant learning and it will, and then the other thing it says is that it will teach you to look with contempt. So you'll be ever going to discern good story, stories that lead to virtue and stories that don't lead to virtue. 
in, in one sense. Okay, and then music. What is harmonious in the way of rhythm? And what is arranged in harmony and rejecting all that is out of tune and all that is inconsistent with melody will guide what is previously discordant to concord? Ordering, ordering the soul. You get like this. I, uh, one of the things in Plato's um, Republic, there's this section where he's talking about gymnastic. And he's talking about, well, we read it last month when we were taught when he was talking about the dance and that when, when I read that about music, I made me think about dance and wrestling and that navigating, um, how to move and what is appropriate. But the thing that struck me about that is how bodily it was. And when I read this about music, it made me think of the bodily part of that, that there's like this bodily sense that that creates in us that lets us know this is in harmony because the music affects our bodies. Um, and you can have that sense through it. And I'm just going through. Sorry. Yeah, jump in, jump in. I was just thinking about that the idea of harmony i mean it's also amongst people and relationships and stuff so i think i think there really is you know learning music and and that people start to realize well human life needs to be orderly and harmonious and good relations and so on so i think it builds in us a taste for that because mm -hmm. you, you find people that don't you know that modern music that that what do they call it screamo and things like that i mean that's deliberately discordant and it goes with a real what's the word uh you know we're completely against order and society yeah so mm -hmm. yeah rebels <laughs> yes yeah. i think it's really important because it speaks to the that that reality that you're talking about that and we can be in a certain way where we would find things that are less harmonious, more preferable. Um, one example, it's kind of silly, but um, I'm, I'm a big foodie. I love really good food, um, high quality wine, chocolate. So I've raised my children this way. And would you know, they do not accept Hershey's. They want the truffles, you know, like, so they have it, like, these are expensive. Can you please have a Hershey bar? <laughs> but this is an example. Their taste buds are more developed and a little more sophisticated or refined. And so they want the Linda truffle. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, but we can afford that once a month, so. <laughs> Hershey bar or nothing, <laughs> but um, yeah. All right, and geometry, we have five minutes left. Uh, sowing the seeds of equality and just, just proportion in the soul, which is fond of learning, will by means of beauty of continued contemplation and plant in you an admiration of justice. Oh, geometry can do that? Wow. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I, well, I love this entire paragraph. I just said love because I feel like it gives and brings a, a greater purpose to the everyday um, struggles as you're learning different things. And I'm dealing with little kids. And so every, you know, whether it's learning to read, sit, sitting through a story, understanding uh, we've been practicing our narration, all of that, like none of that comes easy, but I think like realizing that virtue in itself like we that doesn't just come naturally either for us and that it is but we do these things and I like that the arts themselves like geometry itself is what will help us perceive and create a desire for that virtuous life of justice and I love that like what you were saying about that these are arts that lead us toward, that need to be refined and to be grown in, to lead us toward truth perception and toward this harmony and towards virtue. Keeping that at the forefront of our minds, telling that story to ourselves, 
for me to my children, telling the story of the reason why we do this education in the day to day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's it good. It reminds you and brings you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, and, and that, that's how that, that highlights such, and I'll end on this thought. I know it's completely, well, yeah. Um, it highlights the difference between modern and classical education in that our goal is not to teach something that they're going to use in a utilitarian way. Like I'm only going to teach geometry if you're going to specifically need that particular way of doing math in your job. And if you don't specifically need that in your job, it's arbitrary and a great harm that I have to study this. Whereas in classical education, it cultivates how you perceive. So it doesn't matter if you use that equation or that mode because it's how you, it's training your perception. Yeah, exactly. And it's getting teachers to understand that because I mean, I'm, I'm, I work at a school mm -hmm. and they're all trained with progressive education. Mm. And we're in Australia here, so, and it's enforced by law. So you've mm -hmm. actually got to untrain people Mm -hmm. to get them to start to think more like this way so right and i think that's the wisdom of using the metaphor and the allegory yeah. is because while we are training people um i do a lot of teacher training and that's why i start with metaphors all the time because it holds the container well, people are learning a lot of little things and it's robust enough to, to keep that they'll, they'll be able to remember it because stories and metaphors are easy to remember. And then it holds this container that then has all the categories where you can put all the other pieces of information and knowledge as they grow and walk their journey. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love what you guys are doing in Australia. I'm just I'm over here cheering. You get uh, Australia on as you endeavor in classical education and seeing that resurgence come. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to see it more we, because we're restrained by a national curriculum here. Yeah, you've yes. got a lot of freedom in the US, so mm -hmm. we don't. Yeah. Well, if there's anything I can do, just let me know. I um, it you, come <laughs> this summer, I um, will most likely start a Australian time zone version of this. Um, that would be in y'all's evening, so it would be my morning. So probably around six thirty or seven p.m. your time. It would be around nine or nine thirty my time. Um, but looking to start that come summertime. Well, well, this time's actually great. It's um, about lunchtime here. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, yeah. um, oh, go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, um, this has been wonderful. I know we didn't get through everything and that's pretty much how it is every single month. You know, there's so many good things to talk about. We just like to leave everyone suffering a little bit, you know, at the end of discussion. <laughs> but um, no, not really. Um, I'm going to send a follow-up email with the links to the two paintings um, and then the recording of this, of course. And um, if you did, if you are... I'll also include the link for the schedule for the year. Um, our next author um, is oh, uh, uh, oh, Alcuin. We will be reading Alcuin next month. So um, that begins on page like 240, 242. Um, there's three parts. That's not too bad. That's about 10 pages, eight to 10 pages. So um, yeah, so we'll be reading and discussing that. I love Alcuin so much. I'm so excited to read that and discuss with you all. And, um, and come with your questions, come with your wonderings. Three questions I always ask myself if I think can't think of anything else is what did I notice? What do I wonder? What does it remind me of? And as I grow in skill in my reading, I will begin to notice with more nuance and with more skill, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna notice something. So. Um, Thank you all for joining me on this fine Thursday. Well, for you, it's Friday, Martin, right? On this fine Friday or Thursday. Yeah, yeah Friday, yeah. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Thank you very much for your time. My God pleasure. Bless everyone. See Thank ya. you. <laughs> Bye.